Light of the world. Lamb of God. Redeemer and Savior. Suffering Servant. God Sent. Messiah. King of Kings. Who do you say he is? On behalf of Big Dream Ministries, I would like to welcome you to Part 1, The Amazing Life of Jesus Christ. This study is a close-up picture of who the Savior was as He ministered on earth. Follow Jesus' life in a sequential manner, how He worked and moved and interacted with people. Hear about the places He traveled and who He was with and how they responded to Him. Starting with the pre-existent Creator, ending with the victorious King of Kings, our teachers, Pat Harley, Jennifer McClish, Kelly Rickman, and Faye Runyon, along with writer Leslie Strader, weave his life and ministry into an unforgettable story. The teaching lessons will coordinate with the scriptures in the workbook so you can follow along with the presenter and make notes in the margins that are provided. Through the teaching lessons and the workbooks, we hope that you will see the life, ministry, and death of our Savior, Jesus Christ, the Son of Man, the Son of God, with fresh eyes, and come to know Him more intimately and love Him more dearly. Let's begin the first lesson as we look at Jesus, the pre-existent Creator, the one who has always been, who existed in glory with the Father before the world was. As we examine one of the most important truths of our faith, that Jesus did not first show up in history in the little town of Bethlehem, but has existed from eternity past, before the foundation of the world. Now let's join Pat for today's lesson, Jesus, the Pre-existent Creator. The amazing life of Jesus Christ is actually a vast understatement because there is not one word in the whole human language that can in any way describe thoroughly the life of Jesus Christ. And that's what we're here for. The next 24 weeks, we are going to be opening up his life to get a deeper, more intimate look of just who our Savior really was as he walked on earth. I have to tell you, and you may have experienced the same thing, when I was a child growing up in Sunday school, every Sunday, we had posters hanging on the wall. And they were done in beautiful watercolors and they were pictures of Jesus. I remember them well. One was Jesus sitting with a lamb in his lap. And there was no real expression on his face. Another one was standing by children and he had his hands on one of the children there and there was no expression on his face. And of course, the one that stands out the most, that we see the most, is Jesus standing, looking into space with no expression on his face. When I got to be an adult, I had the great advantage of seeing a couple of Jesus movies and there was Jesus and he he walked slow, and he seemed to always have a little bit of a frown right there. And so I got the feeling that Jesus was so calm, really passive. And it wasn't until I got into the Gospels where I began to see that that is the farthest thing from the truth. In the book of 1 John, he says this about Jesus, that he is life, that he is love, and that he is light. Now, that means the very fullness of life, the most dynamic life that has ever been on earth has been Jesus Christ. And that he is the greatest amount of love that our minds can't even imagine and that he is light. And so when he comes in, all of the darkness fades away. That is the real Jesus. 
And that is what we're going to be looking at. Now today's lesson is going to be a little bit different from our other lessons because uh, we are looking at the life of Jesus on earth, but today we're not going to be on earth because that's not where Jesus' life started. And so we are going to look at the pre-existent Christ, he who has always been for all eternity. Before we begin there, though, I want to start someplace that you might think is a little bit unusual. I want to show you the great value, I believe, that the Bible puts on joy. Because I want you to remember this as we're looking at Jesus' life. In Psalm 1611, it says this, You will make known to me the path of life. This is what I want you to remember. In your presence is fullness of joy. Not a little joy, not a medium amount of joy, the fullness of joy. So we have Jesus Christ, the fullness of life, the fullness of love, the fullness of light, and now the fullness of joy. In the book of Job, uh, we see, and, and I want you to also understand this because I don't think that we focus enough on this one aspect, that all of creation was created in joy. In Job 38, six through seven, it said this, who laid its cornerstone, and that's talking about the earth, when the morning stars sang together and all of the sons of God shouted for joy. Think about it. When God was creating all that we know, there was music, there was rejoicing abundantly. Everything was created in joy. Proverbs 8, 30 through 31 is wisdom talking. And wisdom says, when I was beside him as a master workman and I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him, rejoicing in the world, his earth, and having my delight in the sons of man. Joy. I um, was on my way home from a meeting one day and I needed tomatoes. And um, the only store in my path was a high-end grocery store. And so I went in to buy my high-end tomatoes. And I got my tomatoes and I was standing in line. There were several people in front of me. And what caught my eye was the gentleman behind the counter checking everyone out. He was from a different country. He spoke with a pretty thick accent. He was in his 60s. But what Draw, drew my eye to him was simply joy. I mean, he, he radiated joy. And with each person that came up to him, he was so warm and kind and pure good cheer. And I looked around. Out of all the people in these, this store, most of them, I would say, were better off than most. And here was a man making minimum wage in his 60s, standing up all day, waiting on these people. And out of all the people in the store, he was the one who had pure joy. Someone said that joy is a magnet that draws people in because it's the one thing that they do not have. And I saw that in this store with a checkout man who was displaying true joy. When we look at Jesus Christ, I want to start with his life in the beginning. We learn about that in the book of John, the Gospel of John, chapter 1. And if you look in your workbooks, if you have a workbook, you might look in your workbooks and see right where I am. It starts off in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. Now, that word is actually the word logos, and it really does talk about the preexistence of Christ, his absolute distinctiveness, and his deity. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. With God. Where was that? 
When my girls were little, we used to sing this little ditty, Heaven is a wonderful place, full of glory and grace. I want to see my Savior's face, for heaven is a wonderful place. Heaven is a wonderful place. We know that it's the dwelling place of God because in Deuteronomy 4, 39, it says just that. Heaven is the dwelling place of God. But God is also called the God of heaven. And Jesus says, I have come down out of heaven. And so before time, space, or matter, Jesus was with God in heaven. We have two places in scripture that that kind of open up a little window for us to peek in and see, well, just what is heaven like? In Isaiah 6, Isaiah says, And I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. R.C. Sproul says that, the train of his robe filling the temple, which is something we can't imagine, is simply that it's the absolute uh, epitome, the maximum amount of majesty. He, King of kings and Lord of lords. He is over all. But there's something else there also. There are seraphim. That's the highest order of angels. And they have six wings. Two, they're covering their face. Two, they're covering their feet. And two, they fly. And they're singing out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. It is such a picture, almost too big for us to comprehend, but it gets even better. Because when we go to the book of Revelation, that vision is expanded by the Apostle John. In the book of Revelation, it says, And he who sat on the throne was like sardius and jasper in appearance. And a rainbow was all around the throne, and it was like emerald. And in front of the throne was this sea of glass or sea of crystal. You can just imagine these are, these are things of high value, of great beauty. There are 24 elders sitting around the throne, and they're all dressed in white, and they have golden crowns on their head. But there are also some unusual beings there, too. Four of them, they are called the living creatures. One of them has the face of a lion. The other one has the face of a calf. The other one has the face of a man. And the last one has the face of an eagle. They also have six wings, only their wings are full of eyes in the front and the back. I remember when uh, my husband was getting ready to teach the book of Ezekiel, and we were talking about the first chapter where there's some very unusual things there that we don't see on earth, just like these uh, angels, these created beings with the different faces. And I have to admit to you that I guess I thought that when God created the world, that this was it, and that he never used his creativity again. But here on the earth, we have seen some unusual things. Think of an alligator or a hippopotamus or a rhinoceros or, or some other things that you have seen that have been created that are just very unusual. Why would I ever think that the creator stopped creating when he created the world. He is constantly creating. And so though I've never seen anyone with the face of a lion, one day I will, because God is the creator. And those four living creatures are calling out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Holiness is not something that he just is. Holiness is all that he is. So he is, his love is holy. His justice is holy. His mercy is holy. His compassion is holy. Holiness set apart, a cut above, a cut way above, is the word that we use for God. But something else is there in heaven, and, and don't miss this. There is joy in heaven. There was joy in creation. There is joy in the presence of God. But 1 Chronicles 16, 27 says, Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and joy are in his place. 
So those four living creatures, they're experiencing joy. Those 24 elders are in the presence of God and they are experiencing joy. In Hebrews, it calls to us as believers who now are covered by the blood of Jesus. It says, Hebrews 12, 22, we no longer come to the mountain as Moses did, a place of thunder and lightning and fear and trembling, but we come to the holy city, to Mount Zion, the city of the living God, and to myriads of angels, and to the general assembly, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of righteous men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant. That's where we go as we come into the presence of joy. Let's go back to the first chapter of John. John says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God in heaven, and the Word was God. Jesus is God. That means that he has all of the attributes of God. He is infinite. He is eternal. He is unchangeable in his being. He is all wisdom. He is all power. He is all present. He is all holiness. He is all justice. He is all goodness. He is all truth. That is who Jesus is. He was with God and he is God. He is like God and always has been. He didn't come into being just in a manger in Bethlehem. He didn't just appear in Mary's womb. He has always been. Oswald Sanders made this statement. I think it's just beautiful. He says, Jesus was indeed the meeting place of eternity and time the blending of deity and humanity, and the junction of heaven and earth. Jesus says, I have come down from heaven. And when he did, he brought a bit of heaven down with him. But Jesus is something else. John goes on to say, all things came into being, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. And so, again, Jesus is God and Jesus is the creator. Remember, we learned that there was great joy in creation. Did you know that that is the only emotion that is mentioned in the Bible when it talks about creation is joy? It's amazing to me that science, who oftentimes will not admit that there is a creator, have, has really come to a place of seeing that for some reason, this world is made only for us. It's the only place that they have found that we could survive. We need sun, but not too much. We need rain, but not so much. We need air and not too little. Somehow, every little thing works together to provide a place for us. Perfect, but something else. Scientists also see it was created for our pleasure, for our pleasure, for our delight. Beloved, a couple of years ago, decided to put a, a, a garden in the backyard to sort of fix the garden, the backyard up a bit. And so he started working on it and planting things and whoo, all of a sudden we have a garden. And for most of the year, I can go out into my backyard and find something that when I look at it, truly look at it, it is a thing of wonder and beauty. We went to Grand Canyon last summer, and as I stood over the edge, first of all, it's terrifying to do that, but the next thing is you cannot get over the fact that here is something so grand and so beautiful that it takes your breath away. It brings you into a place of absolute worship because of the grandeur of it all. And the whole world was created for our delight and pleasure. And lastly, he created man and woman. Let us make man in our image, the triune God, and then he breathed into man the breath of life. And then 
He planted a garden. Now the whole world is here, but that's not quite enough for his kids. And so God himself planted a garden. I think my beloved planted an awesome garden. Can you imagine what God planted? If God planted the garden, what it was like? And he gave the kids a place, their home, that was beautiful and for the delight and pleasure of their eyes and their hearts and their soul. It's amazing, isn't it? He is a totally overindulgent parent when you think about it. I mean, you know, you can give your kids a car, but how many of us can give our kids the world? He gave their ki his kids the whole world. Go forth, be creative, be adventurous, explore, see all the wonders of the things that I have created for you. Only there's just one rule, one. Don't eat from the tree of good and evil. Tim Keller said that God did not create man because he was lonely. I mean, it appears like there's a lot of things up there in heaven, a host of angels, and, and certainly the Trinity would not allow God to be lonely. Within the Godhead, there's absolutely perfect fellowship, and he didn't create us because he needed to love, because after all, he does have perfect love in the Trinity for sure. He created man to give joy because he is the joy giver. But there was a problem in the garden. Satan, the great joy robber, God said, don't eat. Satan says, eat. He made them believe that God's word was not true, that somehow God lied, that somehow God was holding back some great goodness or some great joy, depriving them of something that they didn't have, though they had fullness of joy. And so he convinced Eve to take a bite, and she convinced her husband to do the same. One rule, and Satan led them into outright proud, loveless, rebellious, thankless act of self-assertion against the God who had given them life and joy. We have a dog, Jim. We went for a long time after our girls grew up and went away. We went for a long time without a dog because we had to bury three of them and they had become our great friends and Beloved said he could not bury one more dog. It was too painful. And so we were not going to get another dog. And we went for about 10 years without another dog, but on about the nine and a half year, I just decided it would be so lovely. If I could just have a dog, then I would really be happy. And so I started campaigning. You know how you do. You mention it a little bit, and then you kind of mention it, and you tell them all the good reasons why we should have a dog, and I did all that. And I was losing, because Beloved said, no, we're not getting a dog. Well, one day, he was on his way to Home Depot, and I just kind of casually said, now, how about stopping by PetSmart, because at PetSmart, they have all the shelter dogs there this, this very day, this Saturday, it's it. And he just looked at me with lips pressed and walked out the door. Well, later that afternoon when he was home, I said, so did you see my dog at PetSmart? And he said, I don't know, but they had a lot of good ones. And right then I knew we were ready to go. So I said, well, let's go up and look. And we went up and looked at the dogs and there was Jim in a cage and he looked like he was the saddest dog in the world. He'd actually been in this shelter for nine months. And I just fell in love with Jim, and Beloved said that Jim could come home with us. Now, Jim came home with us from living in a shelter, most of the time in a little cage, and he came home to a home that had two acres of land, and we bought him the best little bed, and we got him good food, and we got him all kinds of little toys, and we loved him, and we gave him lots of attention, and took him walks, and we were just really good, indulgent parents. We had one rule, don't leave the yard. We thought two acres was enough. Don't leave the yard, because we live on a very busy street. And if you go down our driveway to the street, there for Jim is death. Don't do it. Jim 
had all of this goodness, and yet the only thing he wanted to do was break out of the house and go running all over the place. And one day he got out of the door when I wasn't looking and I went after him and that dog was running as fast as he could. I know you think this is a lie, but I'm telling you the truth. His ears were flopping back and he had a big smile on his face and he was singing, free at last, free at last, thank God I am free at last. And he ran down that driveway and not happy to stay on the sidewalk. He ran back and forth across that busy road, ears flying, smile on his face, not realizing that he was instant away from death. In the garden, they had everything and they gave it up. James McDonald says that when God says don't do something, he's saying don't hurt yourself. Don't hurt yourself. You see, with Jim, we were saying, Jim, don't hurt yourself. Don't kill yourself. Don't be roadkill, Jim. It's not attractive. Well, the kids disobeyed God. And when they did, sin entered man. And from that day on, all of their descendants have struggled, have been enslaved to the sin within. But they had another, another enemy, and that was Satan, who still continues to deceive us. So God covered their nakedness. God cursed them. But then he gave a promise. He said to Satan, I will put enmity between her seed and your seed, Satan, and he shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. You're going to hurt him. But oh boy, he is really going to take care of you. You see, the joy robber had done a good job of robbing joy from mankind. I know all about that, having joy robbed from your very soul. When I was 32 years old, I was in the darkest place of my entire life, and it really was because of sin. And there was nothing I could do to get out of it. Now, I always thought of myself as a problem solver. There's a problem, you know, read enough books, <laughs> read enough Dear Abbeys or whatever, and you're going to find a solution to the problem. And I had done everything, and I could not find a solution to the problem. And I literally was helpless, and I was hopeless, and I was in a very, very deep depression where I could not even function. You see, this is what sin does. It robs you. It robs others of all joy. And then I got to the end of me, and I literally cried out into the air for help. Satan is a tremendous power. We like to think of him as a myth, but he is anything but a myth. And actually, I think he loves the fact that we think that he's a myth because then he can do his work and not have to take the credit for the evil that he does. But Ezekiel 38 and 1 Timothy tells us that he really is a created being and that he, through his own ambition and his pride, he rebelled against God. He wanted to be God. And now he works in absolute opposition to God. He is not omnipresent. He is not omniscient. He is not omnipotent. And nor is he divine. However, he has incredible power and he rules over a very powerful kingdom. He is highly intelligent. He's more intelligent than you are. And he leads a vast array of spirit beings known as demons. And his influence is worldwide. It is worldwide. He's got many names, some of them. The destroyer, the accuser of the brethren, the deceiver of the whole world, and the father of lives. He's described as a murderer from the beginning, and the truth is not in him. He's called the devil, the ancient serpent, the adversary, the prince of the power of the air, and Beelzebub. He came for three reasons. He came to kill, to steal, and destroy. That's his mission statement right there. And he will do anything 
to kill your joy, to rob your joy. That's his job. The New Testament makes it very clear that he is a superhuman personality and he is a great enemy of the kingdom of God. I thought this was a very interesting quote, that sin itself cannot contribute to the vast misery of the world. In a book, The Prince of Darkness, the author says this, all of the misery of the world cannot be only because of the sin within man. So much of evil is too masterfully organized, too subtly planned, too skillfully directed, too logistically remorseless for it all to be accredited to the man's sin. There has to be a design. There has to be a diplomacy. There has to be a cunning and a strategy. And there have to be campaigns. There must be a mastermind behind such activities. And as we look around the world today, we have to confess that Satan is real and he is a genius and he is still the great joy robber. One of his greatest strategies is to promise a desired good by doing wrong. And I will say that for all of you sitting here and all of you in the listening audience, you can think about your own life, you can think about the lives of others and know that that is absolutely true. To promise something good by doing wrong, that is what his mission is. So what are the consequences from this great rebellion against a overindulgent parent? From that time on, you and I have three enemies. We have the sin that's within. Well, Patsy, it would just be so nice if you did such and such, promising something good if I do something wrong. You see, that's the sin within. But there is something without that can bring on circumstances that are very, very difficult. Some enemy that is going to be after us as God's people. And then there is this whole world system that has developed since creation, a culture that is always pulling us, always trying to teach us and instruct us away from the things of God. Romans 3.10 makes one thing very clear. No matter how great you think you are, in the eyes of God, you are still a sinner because sin is within you. We are separated from God, Romans 1.18 says. We are separated and we are now enemies of God. You know what we are? We are children of wrath. We are children as sinners who deserve the wrath of God. Pretty strong. You know what we need? We need a savior. Why did Jesus come to earth? We needed a savior. Why did Jesus live the, leave the glory of heaven for us? Because he knew we were hopeless, we were helpless, and we desperately needed a savior. And a savior was on the way. God had promised it in the garden that he was about to do something, that there would be a savior and he would come. 200, I'm sorry, 2,000 years before Jesus, God told Abraham, I'm going to send one of your descendants is coming and he's going to be a blessing to the whole world. The whole world is going to be blessed by one of your descendants. A thousand years before Jesus, he told King David that one of King David's descendants was going to sit on a throne and that, that kingdom would be an, an eternal kingdom. It would have no end. And then came the writing prophets, the writing prophets, those powerful men who came and were directed by God to speak to the people to first of all, tell them what sin was. Let me tell you where you're going wrong. Here is what you're doing that God wants you to stop. And then they gave them a way out. Repent and turn to God and turn back in obedience. And then he said, someone is coming. One prophet after another spoke about someone was coming. And with that came great hope for what we call 
salvation. Jeremiah said that God would raise up a king who would reign and act wisely and his name would be the Lord, our righteousness. Isaiah said that he would be our wonderful counselor, our mighty God, our eternal father and a prince of peace. And oh, don't we need peace. Micah said that he would be born in Bethlehem and Zechariah said that he would come mounted on a donkey and he would speak peace to the nation and his dominion would never end. We needed a savior. Sitting in my den that day, crying out to the air, I don't know if there's anyone out there, but if there is, please help me, please save me, please help me. And I was just sobbing, just sobbing, crying just so much. And God began to reach through the incredible darkness of my soul and began to show me that there was help and there was hope and that I had a savior. And step by step, he began to heal me and to heal my marriage and to give us a new life with him. You see, hope was on the way. John said that Jesus had existed forever and that he dwelled in heaven and that he is the creator and the joy giver. And he is the one who brings light into the darkness. And he came because we had two enemies, sin and Satan, and we were absolutely helpless before God. We needed someone desperately to free us from the slavery of sin we needed someone desperately who would take on the power of Satan. We needed someone desperately to save us from the wrath of God and to bring us into the kingdom of God and to become children of God. We needed to be reunited with our joy giver that we could live with him in joy forever. And that is why Jesus left heaven to come to earth. Let's go back to the checkout guy. As I got closer with my tomatoes to checking out, I just continued to observe how incredible this man was. And when I got up, I, I put my tomatoes down on the counter and I said, sir, you are so joyful. And he looked at me for a minute and he leaned across the counter and he said, I know my savior, Jesus Christ. Joy, the joy giver. Walter Knight sums it up beautifully. Joy is the flag that flies over the castle of our hearts, announcing that the king is in residence today. And oh my, he is the joy giver. And the king came. And he came for you and me so that our joy might be complete. <laughs>